We're going to uh, uh, switch gears a little bit and uh, move on to uh, what we're calling uh, flash talks. These are going to be five minute talks by four presenters. Uh, Mim is going to have a little chime to give the uh, speakers a 30 second warning. So we're going to uh, try to keep things on track. Uh, uh, we've asked several cooperators to offer examples of successful scientific communication in different medias and solutions. And we are using this flash tile style so each presenter will be able to uh, present their information but we won't be doing any questions. However, there's going to be ample time during the break, coffee break, after these flash talks so you should, you know, meet up with one of the presenters if you have a specific question. So the first presenter is Mark Ferguson and Mark is a wildlife biologist with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and he works primarily on conservation of rare, rare fish amphibians and invertebrate populations and the title of his talk is the short sweet and engaging story of freshwater mussels hi everyone i'm going to be talking to you today a little bit for a few minutes about uh, freshwater mussels so this is your bio nerd talk in the morning uh, we have 18 different species that occur in Vermont. Um, that's more than any other New England state has, and that's mostly due to the presence of Lake Champlain here. Uh, but they're found pretty much throughout the state, and uh, mostly in rivers, also in some of our lakes. What, I, what I'd like to do today is uh, focus in on a really interesting aspect of their life cycle, that is their reproduction. So how do mussels go about making more mussels? Well, here's an illustration that uh, pretty much puts it in a nutshell. Starting at the bottom here, uh, individual muscle is either male or female. It's got separate sexes. So the right time of year comes along, the male releases its sperm into the water column and it's in a river situation. Sperm floats downstream until it encounters a female. The uh, female brings the sperm in through her, uh, through her siphon. It enters into the gill pouches where it uh, fertilizes the eggs and she produces her larvae. But this is where it gets really interesting, because that, uh, that larvae, which is called a glochidium, it's, it's microscopic, it's just a tiny little speck. It's actually a parasitic stage of the muscle. This is unique among bivalves, and it must attach itself to a host fish in order to survive, and it has to do it pretty quickly. But not just any fish will do. Uh, many mussels are very specific. They only use a handful of species of fish as a host. In some cases, only a single fish. Um, but if it is successful, attach it to the fish. It'll take a ride for a while, get some, some nutrients until it's finally big enough that it falls off to the stream bed and lives out the rest of its life. Now, this might seem like kind of an overly complicated system for, for an animal. Um, may not seem like a, a really high chance of success, but it actually has some advantages to it. One of those is that uh, mussels are sedentary. They don't move around much, they stay put. So how do they manage to disperse themselves? How do they populate new areas? How do they get good genetic mixing over a large scale? Well, the answer is right there at the top. It's that transportation system, the fish. Once the glycidium gets onto a fish, Fish is mobile, it goes where it wants to. And by the time that uh, small muscle is ready to drop off, that fish can be quite a ways from where the parents were. But there's still that sticky problem of how does the female get that little bacidium from herself attached to a fish? It seems like a difficult thing to do. Well, it turns out muscles are pretty smart, at least in an evolutionary sense, for a fish with, for an animal with no brain. <laughs> They've come up with some adaptations to up their odds of success. And here's an example. This is a female lamp mussel. And see that structure on the edge there? That's actually an adaptation of her mantle tissue. And it kind of looks like a fish, doesn't it? It's got an eye spot, some nice patterning. That's exactly what it's supposed to look like, a fish. She uses that as a lure to entice a host fish in close enough that she can infect it with her uh, glycidium. And it's not just the way that that uh, that structure looks, it's also her behavior. Let's see if I can do this. Oh, I'm not sure how to do this actually. This is one of my <laughs> one of my videos. 
Well, anyway, she, uh, anyway, she will start to twist that lure when she's ready to release her glycidia. It looks pretty live, doesn't it? So when fish just can't stand any longer, it goes in for the kill, bam. <laughs> it's a face full of glycidia, it enters the mouth, they attach onto the gills, and you have success for the muscle. Uh, fish may not be too happy, but generally it's, it does not affect the, the fish. Here's another strategy that they use. They put their, uh, some species will put their, their glycidia into these packages called pollutants. Um, and then they release these into the water column. These look something like fish, like something that a fish would like to eat again, something to eat. And uh, if, uh, whoop, I better keep going. If a fish bites on that, then again, you get infection. Sometimes these look pretty elaborate. In this case, you've got pigmentation and structures that make it look like an aquatic organism. So I'm going to flip through here. If you have success, they attach themselves to the gills, and eventually you get uh, these young mussels. Now, this is interesting information to have. It's actually been very valuable to scientists because they've been able to take this process into a laboratory or a hatchery setting and reproduce it. Um, taking the, uh, the glochidia from the females, infecting a fish, and if done right, the result is you get young mussels that you can then reintroduce into the wild to uh, recover populations.